Hello, Jordan. What's up, Michael? You're in a great mood. Terrible, terrible mood. It happens. Hey, the fact- I don't think, I can't remember the last time I've been in a mood this bad. Well, and we're still podcasting. We're still doing what's supposed to be done, even though you're in a bad mood. (laughs) Just got to do it, man. And you're going to be in a good mood in a second. I know you. You're so extroverted. We're going to have some great conversation and you're going to think of all the listeners and be like, I'm going to put myself in a good mood and you're just going to (laughs) be. I hope so, man. I really hope so. You're on the road. You're traveling. It's Passover. Yeah, tonight's the first night of Passover. Missed jujitsu this morning. Just day is getting a little bit more hectic than I would have liked. <laughs> the uh, the Seder, first Seder is coming up and the window for getting my workout in is rapidly, <laughs> rapidly shortening. <laughs> getting some obnoxious comments on my most recent post, which really aren't even that obnoxious. I think I'm just so on edge that I'm like, oh, motherfucker. So yeah, just overall, not, not great. And then apparently this microphone is so ridiculously, this travel microphone I got is so sensitive. It's catching... Everything I do is every every time this chair squeaks, you could probably hear it. And I know David, our podcast producer, is like, "God damn it! Now I'm going to need to edit every every single sound." He's he's the top of the top, though, and I know if anyone can do it, he can do it. How are you doing? How's your workout today? I'm good. It was solid. It was solid. I switched. Uh, I have a couple of gyms, which is a strategy that's been working out well for me, all like yeah. low cost gyms and kind of mix it up based on what I want to do that day. And I went to one on a push day that I never go to because it has a skinny bench. Um, and I just don't like narrow benches for, for dumbbell bench pressing. And uh, But this one, it has a slight incline and the other gyms don't have a 15 degree incline. They only have like a 30 degree or 45 degree incline. And I wanted just a slight incline. So I gave it a shot and it went reasonably well. And yeah, it was a good, good, solid, good, solid push day. How's your neck feel? Neck feels good. Good. Just in general, how's my neck? Well, I know like oftentimes you don't like skinny benches could potentially hurt your neck on while you're benching, you know? Yeah. Yeah. could tweak something. And just from a performance point of view, like super, super suboptimal for me and every single human who ever inclined dumbbell benched in existence, you going like back to the Donnie Thompson times, fat pad, going, going back to Adam and Eve. Yeah. I love the fat pad. Um, yeah. So it went well, went a little, uh, higher rep, lower weight on the accessory work. And here we are podcasting. Let's go. What's on the docket for today, bro? I, I was thinking about something. And this, th- I'm just stating what I believe are facts, even though it might come off as somewhat complainy, but I'm complaining for the people. I'm not complaining for me. I'm not complaining for you because we're in a position where this isn't a huge issue. But for the average person, society is set up in a way And like our day-to-day work schedules are set up in a way that are so suboptimal for health and longevity. And let me back Mm -hmm. up for a second. Jordan, what is the, the number one thing someone can do? And we'll we'll just call it. Okay. But, but go, go broader, go broader. What, what would you call the best quote unquote drug for longevity? It, would you say it's pills? Would you say it's nutrition? Would you say it's exercise? Would you say it's sleep? I'd say exercise. Yes. And I think movement. All, all of the the majority of good research points to that finding as well. So let me dig down a little deeper. How much movement? And 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 this is like no restrictions at all. This isn't like, okay, we need to fit it into someone's busy lifestyle who has four kids and works 50 hours a week. Just like no holds barred. What would you have them doing every work? Not to optimize. We're not going like over the top with 17 minutes of sun first thing in the morning, but just zone two cardio, lifting, like how much of each and what would you have them doing in a given week? So you want me to give my ideal scenario for someone who has no restrictions in time, energy, and money, any of that stuff, like ideal scenario. Okay. Yes, I would for, say for, for both lifespan and health span, longevity okay. and quality of life. So I'm actually glad you brought this up because there's this new study that came out that is actually really pissing me off. It's saying all you actually need to do is walk 8,000 steps two times a week. You don't need to do it 
every day, just two times a week is enough. And I'm like, you're stupid. Number one. Number two is I would say minimum 7,500 steps a day, minimum. I think it's like, and I could go off on that, but Mm -hmm. minimum 7,500 steps a day. Mm -hmm. I would say strength training two to four times a week, two on the low end, four on like the higher end is I think is plenty. I would say zone two cardio two to four times a week, minimum 20 minutes per session. I would say mobility work. I don't want to put a a time on it because that is, is I think much more dependent based on how much mobility and flexibility you already have. But I would say mobility work daily, I think is really, really important. And so we got mobility, we've got strength, we've got steps and we've got zone two. I think that's probably what I would say. Any, because we're on the optimizing side of things, any zone five? Wow. Good point. Can't believe I forgot that. Yeah. Zone five, high intensity, one to two times a week maximum. And I would say for most people, probably one time a week is where you're really going to max out the benefits for most people, unless you're a very high level athlete to begin with. And that usually takes between 10 to 25 minutes, depending on, on what type of sprint work you're doing. Amazing. So we're talking you know, with warm up and, and workouts, we're talking three to four hours of strength training. We're talking uh, three ish hours of zone two cardio. We're talking, you know, a bunch of zone one, which is just walking, getting your steps in that can be worked into your day to day life. But for a lot of people who are working desk jobs, and if you compare the amount of knowledge workers now compared to the number that we had in, you know, a hundred years ago, we have so many more now of people who are struggling to get steps in during the day. Um, so we, we have a, a solid amount of zone one cardio walking around time and, uh, and then mobility, um, an hour, you know, we'll call it an hour, less than an hour of zone five, but a zone five session a week, we're, we're well over 10 hours. We're in like the 12 plus hour range of physical activity per week, which breaks down to two plus hours, you know, six days a week mm-hmm. is a lot for people. And, and especially like, I don't have the stats in front of me, but the number of families who could um, sustain on a single salary in 1950 compared to the number of families who can sustain on a single salary in the current year, like vastly different. Um, So we have so many more families that have two working parents and like people are just between that wanting to have a social life, kids, if you have kids, like all of these obligations, not to mention the 40 to 50 plus hours working isn't, you know, working on a farm. You're not bailing hay. You're not getting some of this strength and cardio work in during your day job. You're sitting like this, hunched over like this, pushing papers, punching the 10 key, doing whatever for so many jobs. It's just, it's frustrating to me to to see people struggling who are so busy and overwhelmed with things. And look, I'm not making excuses for these people either. Like, there are ways to get it done and many, many, many people do, but, and I'm, I actually lean that way in general, like personal responsibility, individualism, like find a way to get it done. But I would be happier if the way that the systems were set up allowed people to have more balance between, uh, health and the other obligations in their life. Dude, you're preaching. Yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. Completely agree. I love that. It's not complaining at all. I think that's, man, I couldn't agree more. I d- but anytime I see someone complaining about like the current systems, I I view it as complaining because it's like, look, we should be showing gratitude for being in like the safest, best time statistically in all of human history. Did you see there was a study done recently? I believe it was in the UK. I forget how many companies were a part of it. I forget. I think in my brain, it's either like 40 or 400. I can't remember which one or if it's even correct on either of those. But there was a a, a significant number of companies that for the purpose of the study moved to a four-day work week Mm -hmm. and and they measured productivity uh, in terms of differences between a five-day and a four-day work week, all of that. And it showed that productivity didn't actually change from a four-day to a five-day work week. And in some cases, there was slightly more productivity. And I was like, man, that's amazing. I believe it, especially because (laughs) you and I spoke about this years ago when we were talking about, you know, how 
like how much people actually work. And, and when you and I were really, really going at it and people say, yeah, I'm working this many hours a week. It's like, okay, for the average 40 hour work week, how many of those hours are actually spent legitimately working? And it's like, I would imagine the vast majority, maybe six to eight, <laughs> like actually like <laughs> I was, legit I was a- working. You know, what were you going to say? I was going to, I was going to be more generous. I was going to say 12 to 16, but yes, it's not a lot. Maybe that's just my bad mood coming through (laughs) and just being super pessimistic. But like, especially for people who work a lot of desk jobs, like I see all the time they're on their phones, they're on social media. And then as soon as someone walks up, oh, phone down. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And then, and then they're like, I don't know if all that time adds up to 12 to 16 per per week well, who knows and, but and it, and I'm I'm included in their like BS meetings too right like if the yeah, company yeah, yeah, was yeah. better structured they would like those meetings are technically work but those meetings probably could be an email and don't need to happen which yes yeah yeah so it it is interesting and there's one part of me that loves that and there's also the part of me that hates that the part of me that loves that is more time with family more time for exercise and fitness more sleep all that stuff it also does make me think about In a separate but similar discussion, UBI, universal basic income, where everybody gets whatever, $1,000, $1,200, $2,000 a month, whatever it is, just to make sure everyone has some income. And some people would use that money really, really well, right? They would use it for food. They would use it to pay off their mortgage, They would whatever it is. Other people would use that money for drugs or for things that you don't need. Same thing, you give a lot of people this extra time. Some people would use it for getting exercise in, for going to the grocery store, for doing things that they need to do. And other people would use that time for drugs or Mm -hmm. for like whatever it is, right? So it is an interesting conversation around pros and cons of those and having that extra time to be able to really focus on the things that would bring you and your family more benefit. Yeah. No, you're you're hundred percent right. So to to say like okay let's pretend that the work day got shortened by 25% and you could use that time for health and fitness or your example like a 4 day work week instead of a 5 day work week uh how many people would actually use that extra time to better their health and fitness i don't know the number i it sure isn't 100% it's probably not like it's probably less than 70% i don't know what the actual number is but um you know, I'm I'm somewhat extrapolating from the handful of individuals who I do know personally or work with who are like, like, you know, working at, at, like lawyers or working in in the legal field or working in and are just piled with work, um, and also mm-hmm. trying to like improve their health and fitness habits as well and seeing those struggles. Um, yeah, but but then, like I mentioned, there's a personal responsibility aspect to it too, where regardless of the situation, oh, you take your work week from 50 hours down to 25 hours. How are you going to use those extra hours? Are you going to use them drinking to like, you know, cope with, or like, are you going to play video games for seven hours at night instead of five hours and getting an hour and a half workout in? That's where it falls on the individual. Yeah. Even just today, (laughs) I just put out a YouTube video today about basically where to start if you have to lose a hundred pounds. And I said, it could be 50, it could be a hundred, could be 150. But like, I just used that number, like a lot of weight to lose. And there was one person messaging me being like, ah, I just can't find the time to walk. And they messaged me this on Instagram. And, and I replied, I said, well, what are you doing right now? And they were like, well, I'm just sitting down messaging me. So why don't you stand up and walk around while you're messaging me right now? It's mm. one of those things. I think people are actually given so much time. Now, the, the interesting conversation there is like, what type of job is it? Like lawyers, for example. Lawyers are oftentimes working super early in the morning until wicked late at night. And, and it's, it's a different type of job where oftentimes they might not be able to, to walk. I think for someone in that situation, maybe who, who might have a little bit of expendable income, getting a walking pad, having that in their office so they can do that as they're combing through papers and reading and all of that. But it is very interesting, the different types of jobs and, and the different types of people and personalities that how they would respond to having more time on their hands to do that stuff. Yeah. And, and by the way, we were talking at the beginning of this optimizing health span and lifespan, not minimum effective dosage, right? I think no matter mm-hmm. what, I think, you know, single parent with a job and kids, I still think that you can find a way to get 
two to three 30 minute lifts and get your steps in. Like, yes, it's harder for you than someone else, but you can juggle that load. Um, but doing what's, uh, uh, optimal or like on the higher end of the activity to enhance quality of life is hard, is, is near impossible for a lot of people given their current life setup. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I like that you used lifespan, lifespan terminology, lifespan. Peter Atia. Life, Peter Atia, which is <laughs> such a smooth Health transition. Span, lifespan. <laughs> Jordan is just on his transition game, podcast pro with the silent snack, the blackberry, not, not a crunchy popcorn, not a potato chip or something along those <laughs> lines. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen you eat a potato chip. Blackberries. Which, you know what? And raspberries, black and raspberry. Got wow. a little mixture. Wow. Very nice. Uh, outlive. We, we both realized that Peter Atia's new book, um, you know, recording this on April 5th, just came out within the last week. And uh, I think it was last night or the night before, we both realized that we are simultaneously reading that book and actually at the same place in the book. Dude, I think this book has a real chance to be the first book that I've read front to back in a long time. Mm. <laughs> like mm. I've read a lot of books, but not read front to back a lot of books, especially in, in recent years. And so, so far I'm very invested in this book. I didn't like how it started. I, I was a little bit unsure based on the the initial analogy the he was using, the story <laughs> he was telling, fallen eggs all over the place. Fortunately, I kept listening and it actually became a great story to sort of refer back to. But uh, yeah, uh, so far I like it. I know you're reading the hard copy. I'm listening to it. He narrated it super well. Um, so I know you said the, the written work is, is also fantastic. And so I'm excited about this book. It's very well written. It's uh, And just we know the contents are going to be good based on the amount of his website articles and podcasts that listened to or read over the years. Um, and the final chapter is actually on like mental slash emotional health, which isn't something that I've heard him talk about, but uh, have heard a couple really good reviews from guys I respect uh, about that chapter and kind of that the oh. discussions he's had on podcasts around that type of content. So I'm interested because I think I'm going to know, like, it'll be fun to get in the weeds on a lot of these, these chapters in the middle, but I'm, I'm interested in what lies ahead at the end too, is a little, uh, it's a little Easter egg there to, to get to the end of, um, for it, We're not going to go in depth on the book right now. Obviously we're both on chapter three, so that wouldn't make a lot of sense, but we do strongly recommend it and no affiliate obviously here. Uh, but we're going to talk maybe two podcasts from now. So two, three weeks from now, we'll have a more in-depth discussion about the book. And so if you want to grab a copy, it's called Outlive. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best, you know, health, fitness, longevity books um, right now. I mean, th that I can even think of. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. For whether you're a coach or you're just someone who's interested in your own health, um, I think it's a really good read. Yeah, at the very least, you know, because we're only on chapter three, it's written by one of the smartest minds of our time, in spe uh, specifically in regard to longevity. And if you're ever struggling with content ideas, sometimes reading someone else's book will give you great content ideas. Mm. So I think this could be a really wonderful tool to have in your toolbox. And I'm going to try and I'll see if I can finish it when I'm on the plane to Israel because we're flying to Israel and tomorrow. I don't know how that's going to work with my daughter, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. But hopefully between the flight there and then the flight back, I'll be able to finish it. Awesome. I like that plan. Uh, yeah, so we'll talk about that sometime in the next few episodes if you want to pick up a copy. Also, happy Easter. Easter is this coming weekend, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, yep. On Sunday. Do you have plans? Well, my birthday is Saturday and Easter Sunday, so we're just doing a like a big family day on Sunday. Go to church in the morning. Get a, uh, I got to. We have a tradition in our family where whoever's birthday it is gets to pick the meal, and so I'm going pretty standard Sunday brunch. You know, eggs, sausage, uh, Belgian waffles, uh, some bread nice. pudding for dessert. So we're yeah, yeah. Um, I can't believe yeah, you're turning 24, so man. Time flies. Yeah, man. Just eight years ago, I got my driver's license and 
been drinking for three. It's real. The real deal. Nah, man. 36. Yeah. I'm an old head. I'm getting, I'm getting there. I'm making moves. <laughs> uh, you got anything you want to discuss? Well, I will say I just uh, presented at Mike Boyle's. Uh, Mike Boyle's, I, I'm trying, the word academy is popping. It has a Mike Boyle's facility mm. the other day. And there were, uh, there were two people there who were actually in the mentorship. Uh, Carrie, Carrie was there and, and I don't want to mispronounce his name. Uh, Chris or Christos was there Chris, as well. Chris, yep. Chris, Chris. And, uh, so shout out to them. They came over and said hello. And That's uh, awesome. it was a really, really fun time seeing some people in the mentorship there. It was a really good opportunity, a good speaking gig. There were some really good questions about, about social media. There was one, there was one woman who said something that I found very interesting and I, I sort of went in on it. I, I hesitate to go really hard in a live presentation. I don't want anyone to feel like I'm singling them out. But she did say something that I thought was worthwhile to discuss here on the podcast. And I'll start by saying, and I hate that I have to preface this because people are going to say, oh, you're picking on this person. No, no, I'm not picking on this person. I'm not being mean. I'm just being honest and blunt. Basically, she asked me to the effect of, she, she didn't ask. She said she didn't want to have to learn how to do jump cuts. She doesn't want to take the time to do jump cuts in her videos. And she knows that jump cuts might be helpful and they might help people watch the video more, but she just has no interest in doing that. And that wasn't even her question. That was just an aside that she said during her question. And this is at Mike Boyle's facility. This is one of the, the greatest facilities in the world for strength and conditioning where people who want to become some of the best coaches ever will go. And that's why this woman was at the seminar because she probably wants to be an amazing coach that helps a lot of people. And I just find it very interesting that someone, and not just this person, but coaches in general, or even across any population, will put in so much time and so much effort and so much money and so much energy into doing what they need to do in order to learn how to help people to the best of their ability. But then when it comes to actually disseminating that information and putting it out there for people to actually find, they're not willing to equally learn how to make that information more accessible to people, to help those people, to help grow their business. And, and I sort of, I explained this. I was like, I remember I wrote a Facebook post. It was probably back in 2013 or 2014, several years into my online business. And, and I said, just to the effect of, I made a Facebook status when that was a, a thing. I don't know if that's still a thing anymore, but I was like, man, if I was in high school, if someone told me when I was in high school that in order to be a really great coach, I would have to learn how to be a great writer. I'd have to learn search engine optimization. I'd have to learn video editing. I'd have to learn like all these things. I probably would have paid more attention at school. <laughs> but um, especially when it comes to jump cuts, I wanted to talk about that because you and I talk about the main importance of good content is just good content, that your information is good. And that's the most important part. But there are other things that can also help, right? The, the most important thing with working out is just getting in, doing something, right? But there are ways to make your workout more effective. There are way, things that you can do to make it more efficient, to, to get better results that take it just a little bit further, a little bit further. Jump cuts are the same thing. Jump cuts are, are something that don't take a lot of time. They're a little bit tedious but they actually make your content so much more watchable. And I don't really use them on YouTube because for YouTube, I prefer longer form videos. I prefer people taking the time to sit down. And usually with YouTube, people are prepared for that. People are prepared for longer videos and they're okay with that. But for Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, if you're using it, whatever it is, jump cuts are really, really important and they can actually allow you to get more content in in a much shorter period of time, which is helpful on a, on a real or a TikTok style video. So if you're taking the time to make great content, but you don't want to take the tedious four to seven minutes to jump cut your video to make it so that more people will watch that video and benefit from it, like you're really not willing to do everything it takes to be the best that you can be and to help people. And that's just what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. I love it. 
you're you're willing to go into the gym, do your entire warm up, uh, do your warm up sets, and then hit your three by eight Bulgarian split squat, but you're not willing to take that set close to failure. You're stopping seven reps short of failure, even though you're an intermediate trainee and your goal is to build muscle. You're leaving progress on the table. Could be better. A hundred percent. You could re- you can make amazing content, but if it's not well edited, you're not going to reach as many people. Facts. And and guess what? So there's an alternative. It's like if you really, really, really don't want to do that, pay money and outsource it. Yep. But one way or another, if it's more effective for reaching more people, then it has to get done. Or just be so, 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 so good that it doesn't even matter. Yeah. <laughs> Which is probably harder than spending the four to seven minutes to do the jump cut. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bro, I hate the cold, man. Up in Massachusetts right now, I hate the cold. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see I'm all bundled up. I just... Look, I got I a good story. Tex- I got Texas a, is it. I got a good story for this. I got okay. a story. Dorian Yates, all-time legend, <laughs> maybe my favorite bodybuilder. Just a legend. He, uh, back in his days from... I'm going to butcher a lot of elements of the story, but uh, directionally it's correct. So he's in like the Northern UK and, uh, and training out of this gym and like taking a year, he's in his off season between shows. And he, this is late eighties, early not maybe in the nineties, early nineties, somewhere in that time frame. would fly over, you know, do the show and then go back and like train and maybe take a year off of doing a show. So he'd have like a, like an 18 or a 20 month bulk out there. And there was a day where he woke up and there was a snowstorm. And so uh, there was like two and a half feet of snow, no cars on the road. Um, they don't have the, the whatever, like gyms closed that day, like gyms are several miles away, not going to happen. He's like, I'm thinking of my competition. And these guys who I compete against, they're out in California and they're in their 70 degree perfect weather. <laughs> And they're in their convertibles and they have their girls with them and they're driving around on the coast and they're loving life. He's like, fuck them. (laughs) Puts on his boots. He's like, I walked two hours in two feet of snow to the gym. He's like, if I missed that one workout, that wouldn't have made or made my progress or broken my progress. But it's the mindset. It's the mentality. It's like these guys are in their convertibles with their girls driving around, enjoying their sunshine. And here it's 20 degrees and we got two feet of snow. I'm walking to the gym. I'm getting my lift in and walking home two hours and two feet of snow. And that's the difference right there. That's the mentality of like in the cold, in the great north, in Winterfell, Jon Snow, like I'm going to get it done. I don't care what's going on in King's Landing. All right. I don't care what Jamie Lannister and Cersei are up to. I don't care eating grapes out of this or having orgies at Little Fingers like brothel. I don't care about that. I'm up here swinging my sword putting in reps in the great north in the snow. And that's how we get things done, Jordan. Clip that. Clips Nation. Game of Thrones. That's, I love that. Yeah. But yes, it's uncomfortable. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> there are pros but and cons yes, to everything. <laughs> well, you know, there's, it's April 5th and there's snow on the ground out my window. Like that's not optimal, but it's here. It's here. So we need periods of difficult. Maybe you've experienced enough difficulty in your life. Maybe you get enough difficulty, you know, six days a week going in there and like you know, potentially getting choked out. Maybe that's your snow. Who knows? Yeah. And I like the vitamin D. Big fan of the vitamin D. I can't do that. It's like, it's the lack of sun. You know, that's, that's what really gets me for the, that man. I, you know what happened the other day, as soon as we landed here, it was super cold. And the thing happened where like your hands are so cold that it takes like 15 seconds to open and close them. You know, when like your hands get really cold and you can't do that. I was like, ah, this is why I left. I hate this shit. <laughs> What's yeah. It's 42 where you are right now. It looks like, I don't know. 42 degrees. Just freezing. I, I'm, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope someone's in Northern Alberta listening to this and they're like, this is some of the softest, weakest. <laughs> Dude, this is why I hate ice baths. I hate being cold, bro. Being cold is the worst. I fully think this all goes back to Exodus and the time in the desert and like, and like epigenetics and it can all get drawn back to this moment for the record. <laughs> My, all my ancestors who are just in the desert heat, just, 
Yeah, man, I can't wait. Dude, I almost I almost got a sauna delivered to my apartment because I want one in the house that we're going to be building. And we're going to have that for sure in the gym. But I'm just, I love saunas and I don't have access to one right now. And so I told my wife, I was like, <laughs> she saw me looking at saunas on my phone when we were flying. And I was like, I'm going to get one. And she was like, where are you going to put it? And I was like, in our living room. And she was like, Jordan, no. And I was like, yeah. We're put, I was like, you're going to love it. You're going to use it all the time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's going to go perfectly with the feng shui. And she, <laughs> she was like, she, this is like the most serious that I've seen her get in a long time. She was like, Jordan, do not get a sauna and put it in the living room. I was like, we're only there for another like two years until the house is built. And it, you're going to love it. And it's so many benefits. It's so good for you. And it, it's going to look great. She got so mad. <laughs> but now I need to figure out if I can fit it into my office. If I can fit one in my office, I'm going to do it. Uh, f- I have so many thoughts. For the warmth or for like the sauna benefits? The sauna benefits. I just love the sauna. The the difference between function and like aesthetics when it comes to home design is such a oh. <laughs> such like a, a typical male female divide like like making a room yeah. be- beautiful versus making it as functional as possible. It's like because I'm fully with you, but I can also now understand her perspective of Asana doesn't go in this nice living. Like we have this rug that matches this. We have a mirror. We have like this couch over here. We have like stools like this. And then sauna. It's like visually that doesn't go together. So I can understand her perspective. But for you, it's like we have space. I want Asana. Like we're going to use it. It's going to be amazing. Are you about to make I an argument don't... that it would look good? Yes. I... <laughs> okay. Well, then you're wrong. Like <laughs> – <laughs> Here's what I'm about to say though. So I don't think I understand when people say like this matches, like, oh, this match. I don't think I get it because neither, in my mind- Neither of us do. Like the, the floors are wood and the sauna is made of wood. So wouldn't the sauna match the floor? I think it'd have to be the same uh, kind of wood. I don't think like a dark wood and a light wood go together. But I, but I fully don't know what I'm doing. So yeah, people. But I, like my wife is like, oh, this matches this, and it's not necessarily the same color. I'm like, but how does that match? And she's like, well, it matches because of this. And I'm like, ah, I I just don't think I I wrap my head around matching. No, we haven't. We haven't. I don't think we will either. I think there's more important things to focus <laughs> on, like a seatbelt choke or like a uh, like a high kick to the head. I think these are things that are more in our DNA. I don't think for you to spend time focused on complementary colors and like textures and like matching, I don't think that that would produce the greatest like outcome for your life. But I could be wrong. If you're passionate about it, do it. Part of me wants to get the sauna and put it in in like the living room, dining room, because it would be like right next to the dining room table and just make a video about it and like get my wife's reaction to walking in Here we go. to the sauna, just being there. And just- <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. This is perfect. I have, I, I remember a take that I have that I said we were going to talk about it. And I was like, I'm saving this for the podcast. So you did a Zumba class and you, oh yeah. And you loved it. Well, you said you loved it. I mean, you said you loved it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was very fun. I enjoyed it. I think, and the people were. I loved the people more than anything. Here's what I think. I think. Oh. <laughs> I think. Oh God. <laughs> that if Mitch wasn't there, and if you weren't making a video out of it, because you love making content, and you and you're like, uh, you, what did Gary call you? You're like a stand up comic. You like say something, and then like you can do crowd work. Like someone throws something out, and then you like to react to it and see the reaction to that. You're like, you have that DNA. I think that if you were just, if someone told you like Jordan, three days a week, you know, noon to one o'clock, you're gonna go because you love Zumba. You're gonna go do that <laughs> for the for the next ten years of your life. I don't think you would love Zumba. I think you loved that day and like I, the picture was cool and like I bet it was a really fun class. And I'm gonna watch the video. I don't know if it's out yet, but I'm gonna watch it for sure. No, it's not out yet. Um, I think it was the experience around making something more so than you love Zumba. Dude, I, so I think you're 100% right that the experience, 
this, this special uniqueness of the experience and the people were so welcoming and it was that one day and then I'm making content around it, like made it more fun and exciting, uh, without question for sure. There was also the aspect, one of the reasons that I was, I kept saying like, I loved it aside from how amazing the people were and how incredible the teacher was and all of that. One of the main reasons that I, I kept saying I loved it is I had the actual data from my heart rate throughout that whole thing to track. And it was a, a tremendously effective cardio workout. Like there's no question about it. And when I said, where, where, that was, I your, love where it, was your, where was your heart rate? The vast majority was between zone two, zone three. And then there was about 13 minutes in zone four. Okay. which I was actually like really surprised by. But granted, I was going hard dancing. Like I was dancing, very, like the teacher came over to me after. She was like, I didn't expect you. Like to, she she goes, you didn't give a fuck. Like you were just <laughs> going. Like, dude, I was going hard. Um, it's because you know me, a huge part of my personality is looking at how other people are responding, right? It's it's often focused on how other people feel and 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 looking at how they're, how they're interpreting something and how they're enjoying something or not enjoying something. And especially with what we do, I loved seeing how much they loved it. If that makes sense. Part of the reason I loved it so much is because I could see how much fun everyone was having. And especially going back to what we've been talking about at the beginning of this episode, movement, exercise, all this stuff. I know there are many people out there. I know this because they messaged me saying that doesn't count as real exercise. It's, it's, well, that's not right. It's not. And I, I knew that if I went over the top saying how great it was, then number one, everyone who already did it would feel justified in doing it and maybe want to do it more. And people who weren't doing anything but might have been interested in trying something like Zumba would have been more likely to try it, which in turn made me love it even more at the thought of the perspective idea of more people doing it just for the exercise. So that's why I, one of the reasons why I loved it so much. Yes, the teacher was incredible. And yes, the community was great. And they were high-fiving and teaching me the choreography and all that. But I wouldn't do that three times a week, for, like personally. It, like I didn't love it from that perspective. But so yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Fair enough. Fair enough. That makes sense. Question from Randy. Randy says, "Hey guys, I've been an in-person trainer for two years now, and currently do not make training or coaching content on my social media account. For some reason, it really intimidates me, and I've avoided it by thinking." I'm an in-person trainer. It doesn't really matter, but you guys are always hammering how important it is. As an in-person trainer, is this something I need to be focusing on? Thanks for your input and thanks for all that you do, Randy. Thank you for the question, Randy. Randy with an I or a Y? I. Randy with an I. Do you want to stick to start or you want me to start? Yeah. The, the bottom line is to answer the question bluntly, do I need to be making content as an in-person trainer? No. You don't need to be making content as an in-person trainer. If if you have enough clients right now, or if you're working for a gym and you have you're give, being given clients, or you have a fixed salary and you're happy with your job right now, and you want to continue doing what you're doing in the future, and uh, you know you you don't have that like itch to start your own business or that itch to um, you know work with clients online or even that itch to like build an independent training business away from a gym and build your own uh, in-person training business that way, which content can be beneficial for. Um, and and you just don't like making content or the idea of making content and don't want to? No, you, you definitely don't have to. Um, there are a lot of benefits to making content and to uh, helping people and having people know who you are, which creates brand and community in, in some sense and allows you future flexibility. If you wanted to do something other than just work at that gym, coaching clients in person, uh, then you would have the option to do that with the audience that you'd built up by making content. But if your sole goal and focus is coaching clients in person, you have enough clients and that's you want to keep doing what you're doing right now, you don't have to be making content. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I was... uh <laughs> I was just fed one of Gary Vaynerchuk's posts. 
I, he must have he posted it recently, but it must have been like a repost or like he used content from many many years ago. And it was one of the earlier pieces of content that just got me like so into what he was doing and helped me understand what was going on. And it was it was one of the pieces of content where he was talking about how attention is the asset mm. and how once you have attention, you can do anything you want with it, and the power that comes with that, not just power, but like power in a sense of the good that you can do with that is I think beyond, it's way more than I comprehended before I started to build an audience. And I think most people just don't understand the impact that you can have with attention. And there, there are so many things you can do. For example, if you're an in-person coach and one of your clients goes away on vacation and they want to get a workout in and they need help with their single leg Romanian deadlift and you want to film a video for them. Well, you could either send them a video from someone else, which is totally fine. You could send them my single leg Romanian deadlift video. It crushes on YouTube from like 2011. Or you could have one of yours doing it and send it to them. And so that continues to build that relationship. Um, and then if you have that, if you send them that video, then why not just put it on your social media so that it can help other people as well. So you don't have to, you could have an amazing business, amazing work-life balance and really help a tremendous number of people with just coaching in person without ever even having a social media account. In fact, part of me, some part of me would, would like that for myself, but I think it's very easy to overlook the benefits that you can have on the world as a whole through creating content and how that can positively impact other people as well as yourself and your business. So just like Mike said, no, you don't need to. But I think that even sporadically posting helpful information online without the goal of trying to grow a huge audience, but with the goal of helping the few people who see it is better than not posting at all. So would you say that Cause you're, you're kind of appealing to like a, like a moral argument, like you're doing good for the world by posting content. Would you say then that everyone has an obligation to be making content in their realm of expertise in a way that can help people? No, it mainly because I don't think everyone has a realm of expertise. Okay. Or ev <laughs> like, every, I think everyone who does have a realm of expertise. I think. So I don't think you need to, right? Because I, I think I think the I think the moral obligation is to help people mm -hmm. with w help people. Period. Mm -hmm. And if you spend the majority of your time helping people in person and not online, great, then that's fine. But I know for for me personally, and my like you've known this since you've known me. Like my goal has always been help as many people as I possibly can. That's it. Like I want to help as many people as I can. And social media and the internet has given us the opportunity to where we can help people in countries and towns and cities all across the world in an instant. Mm -hmm. But that's not everyone's goal. So your goal doesn't have to be to help people all over the world. Your, good, your goal could be to help improve your neighborhood. Maybe just walk around and help your neighbors. That's one of the things I'm excited about building a, a home gym is I want everyone in my neighborhood to know like, hey, we can go work out in Jordan's gym. Like just gonna leave it open. We can just go on his property, go in the gym, that's fine. So I think the obligation is just to do your best to help people regardless. And if so, and, and I think social media is one of the easiest ways to do that. And most people I don't think are actively going out of their way to help people. And so if you're just sitting on your couch and you're not helping people in general, well, cool, pick up your phone and help people. But if you'd prefer to do it at your own local gym or in your community or neighborhood, I think that's equally import as important as as what I'm doing. It's no less important. It's helping your individual community, helping people around you is equally as important. Just because someone is helping people in other countries doesn't mean that it's more important than what you're doing. It's like they're they're equally important regardless of the the reach that you have. Yeah. The the improvements of technology and the internet essentially has given us uh, the ability to scale this like massive lever. You can you can speak to ten, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people like that, um, whereas it was so much more difficult before. Um, interesting. Yeah. 
there's also there's an important distinction between creating and consuming online because mm-hmm. 80% of the time uh I hate my phone. Like I wish it was the 90s. I don't want like to be consuming on my phone. Um but that like scrolling mindless consumption is very different is a diff- not only creates a different outcome but is a d- entirely different f- different feeling and activity than creating content. And and so maybe like for some people their hesitancy towards creating content stems from a dislike of social media um, and the way that they have used it traditionally, but making content feels different than consuming content. So Randy, I would know you definitely don't have to. It might be fun to try and find out if you actually don't want to. Uh, that That might be something that I encourage you to do. Yeah. Good call. Dude, the 90s were awesome. I know we just talked about this like seven pods ago. Did we? Yeah, we did. We did. (laughs) What else we got for this podcast? Those are my things. Society, Outlive, the book, and Randy's question. You got anything? Here's an interesting one. All right. So love for theology. Oh, wow. What a great handle. Love for theology asked, do you worry of how much oil relatives or restaurants use in their foods? Yeah, I worry about how much oil, I don't worry about how much oil restaurants use in their food because uh, I account for it. But I worry about how much oil some relatives use. Oh, like if they're cooking for you? I don't know. Uh, Let's, I I read it the way you read it. Let's, in, in terms of their health. Yeah, I have some relatives who I worry about how much oil goes in their food for sure. I'm not going to name names on the pod, but I do. I think about this. Butter, butter and Just oil. from their, health, their, their own health? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and restaurants, you know, it's, it's become, I don't want to say common knowledge, but in people who are like follow, you know, evidence-based fitness is getting better and better. There's more people making content. Like more people are coming to understand that, you know, restaurants use a solid amount of butter and oil in their food, which adds quite a bit of fats, which you know, is one of the reasons why eating out frequently while not paying attention to what you're eating might make someone gain weight over time or might lead to someone struggling to lose weight. Um, yep. I think that's my answer. Well, how do you, do you talk to them about it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it depends on the relative. It depends like <laughs> in-laws or blood, like it depends like how far, or how close, like, but yeah, we've had, re- dude, in 2016, I grabbed my dad. I said, Hey, we're going for a walk. We'd never gone for a walk together in my entire life or his. And I was like, well, you're going to get in shape and this is how we're going to do it. And I'm going to coach you in person for a while is when I was rolling off Gary and like, you know, so, so yes. So when you stopped coaching Gary and you moved back to Minnesota, mm-hmm. you, did you know that you were going to coach your dad or, or did you not know until you moved back? So I was back for four months. I wasn't really sure where I was going or what I was doing. I, I don't remember. I, I believe that it was like an impulse thing. Like I moved back and like saw him, like maybe saw some of the behaviors and actions and like, uh, you know, there's a wait, but why article called the tail end about like how much time you're going to get to spend with relatives. And then like being with my family and then like kind of extrapolating these nutrition and like lack of activity habits over the long run, given what his age was, you know, I had no interpersonal communicate, very little interpersonal communication skills. Like very blunt hammered it and he's receptive to that but it was like yeah like we need to we need to do better on nutrition and working out i'm going to coach you in person like let's do this and i remember the first the first month he'd complain all the time like to my mom and my family like really was <laughs> was sore all the time like really didn't like it our first workout i'll never forget it we we were doing the warm up outside kind of at my house it was nice outside it was august 2016 and uh He's struggling through the warm up, and he's like, "You know, this is good for today. This is I feel good. I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go rollerblading around the lake. That'll and and I was just like, 
that's not your lift. Like you're not good. Like, okay, but we're still going to do the lift today. Like he was trying to like find ways that he <laughs> historically had worked out. He's a hockey player. Like, and, uh, and yeah, it was just kind of blunt force. And then, you know, he was very receptive to it. Obviously took a lot of sacrifice and hard work and on the nutrition side of things, like he was very, you know, dialed in, um, mostly with food choices and meal timing was how he ended up losing fat. But once he got through that first month, it became easier. He started seeing strength progress, started seeing his body change. Like, and, and then, you know, I don't, at least liked the habit of lifting enough to continue. Mm. Did, did he give you any resistance? Like when, when, for example, either when you first said, Hey, we're going to be doing this. Or for example, when, when he was like, I'm going to go out rollerblading and you're like, no, you're going to lift first. Was there any resistance? Was there anger? Was there like heated words? What, like what happened? Uh, there might've been frustration internally, but he wasn't expressing it. I think he probably felt some degree of gratitude that I would like wanted to do this to help him and was giving my time. There was there was def. I mean, he jokes about this. I don't know how serious it was, but he's like, you know, he's back. Michael's back here, like training me, like spending time with family. He's been out in New York for the last however many years. Like if I don't do this and he ends up like, basically my mom would be pissed if I like went on to do another project and left Minnesota <laughs> because he, <laughs> he didn't want to work out. And so I don't know how much of that actually is serious versus him making a joke out of it, but. Yeah, not a ton. He was pretty receptive to it. He was pretty receptive. So when you first went back and you're like, hey, we're going to start doing this. He didn't ask you. He didn't say, hey, Michael, I want your help. You were just like, hey, no, no, we need to get you in shape. Yeah, yeah. And did you say, hey, this is the time we're going to work out. This is like this, like we're going to go to this gym at this time every day. And and you're just going to do what I say. Did you just lay it out for him? Yeah, yeah. It was three days, three days a week. I mean, I asked him what time and we kind of like agreed on times that worked and yeah, that's what we did. Did you drive together to the gym? No, I was living at my friend John Arnold's uh, condo at the time. He had like a little den area. So we'd, we'd go meet at the gym. Did you work out with him or did you work out before slash after? After I was coaching him. Got it. Okay. And then, and nutrition wise, like, did you, were you watching his nutrition closely or? He, he had had like like ups and downs with nutrition over the years. And, uh, and no, I wasn't watching his nutrition closely. He was mostly eating protein and vegetables and he never was a big breakfast guy. And so it was basically eliminating snacking and coffee in the morning and then protein and vegetables. And if I need snacks, I'll have like a, like a quest bar or a Kirkland bar rather than, you know, crackers or chips or Something along those lines. Got it. Got it. And now he's just, he's in it. He, does he still train three times a week? Does he do more? Uh, he was training four times a week for a long time. He's gotten obsessed with pickleball. And so <laughs> that, that it's like a balance between lifting and pickleball, but he's, he's plenty active um, and, and has maintained like, you know, he, he was, he's six foot, he was 230 and change and got down. He wanted to get his college playing weight was 190. And uh, he was down to 185 at one point, but like 190 to 195 is kind of the range that he's been shooting for and and has maintained. And any time he gets close to 200 is kind of like his, okay, I got to dial it in and kind of get back to that low 190s. Nice. That's like his maintenance range, like 190 to 200. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Does he use Mike's macros? No. No, he's not tracking. No. Nope. Got it. Got it. Okay. Focus on protein and vegetables. And like, basically if I start to get too high on the scale, stop snacking so much at night. You Simple. Know, big, big bowl of Greek yogurt with protein powder mixed in and chop up a banana or chop up an apple in there. Like he has his go-tos that get him enough protein. And then, yeah. It reminds me of, of Peter Atia's story when he like finished that, finished that like swim across the ocean. Uh -huh. And he's eating that burger and the Coke. And his wife is like, you should be less not skinny. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. And, and 
in his description, he was like, I was 50 pounds above my fighting weight. Yeah. And, and then my mind went right to, okay, well, fighting weight, he probably had to cut to his fighting weight. So maybe like 35 to 40 pounds above his actual weight. But it was like, I think there's that, it's so easy to sort of creep up and wait without realizing it over the years. Yeah. Absolutely. I thought that was funny the way it was phrased, less not skinny, less not thin. Cause I had to read it three times. I was like, what is he? Less not, like double negative. He's doing, yeah. Yeah. He, hearing it actually was very easy, but I would imagine reading it was, was a little bit difficult. Yeah. Well, sick, bro. This is a good podcast. Great podcast. If you made it here, we have a, a handshake agreement where we make content for free. There's no AG1 here. There's no better help. There's no, who else is shilling out money to every podcaster in the world? To, <laughs> to, all these, co- none of that. Buy whatever you want. You're not getting an advertisement here. The content's free, but we have a handshake deal. When I first started coaching Gary, I said, hey, is there a contract for this two-year deal? He said, no. <laughs> Spit in his hand, went like this. He said, that's how we do deals. That's how we do deals here at the Personal Trainer Podcast in exchange for this free content please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Personal Trainer Podcast. You can do it right now. The episode's over. Jump on YouTube. If you're driving or something, wait, do it later. We don't want you getting hurt. Uh, hit subscribe. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Yeah, hit subscribe, leave a review, share on your social media, all that. <laughs> hey, hey, if we're going to ask for one thing, we may as well. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, have a great day. Weekly uploads. We're keeping them coming. Jordan, are you in a better mood now? <laughs> Way better. Way better mood. Awesome. Yeah. Got to, going to go get my workout in, but happy Easter to everyone celebrating. Pesach Sameach to everybody celebrating. Ramadan Mubarak to everybody celebrating. The three Abrahamic faiths coming together mm. all around this time mm. of the year. We got a lot going on right now, but uh, thank you. Have a wonderful week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone.